Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, July 8 Council Workshop. Um, we have an apologies from uh, uh, Director Joe Thomas and uh, Councillor Leone Boothby. All others are in attendance uh, along with the CEO and the Director of Planning and um, also the Director of Works and Engineering. Uh, the items tonight is the uh, recovery plan for COVID-19, a business grant program, as well as the community grant program, um, local government reform bill, tree management, the Faith Tanunda Primary School Precinct and the preliminary uh, GM crops consultation process. So with that, the first item 1.1, 1 .1, uh, COVID-19 recovery plan business grant program, which is the uh, agenda items and associated documents has been circulated to members. So I'll cross to you, uh, Mr. CEO, Martin McCarthy. Thanks, Pim. I'm going to do this basically by exception. I mean, uh, we've developed the policy and rules of um, uh, as we're dealing with the business one. I've um, also um, talked to BGWA and RDA Barossa. The fundamental basis of the um, of the grant program is reasonably consistent, I think, with the basic conversations we've had. Um, it's really pretty much open to anybody who runs a small or micro business. We can certainly talk about the limits and all that sort of stuff, so I'd re be interested in that. I suspect it's going to be oversubscribed, so um, I've already taken at least half a dozen phone calls around when it's coming. Um, the structure of it is really very similar to the community um, assistance program, but just trying to make it very as quick as we can whilst there is some form of accountability around it. Um, it's reasonably broad to support any costs that you that businesses may already have incurred or may incur in the future. Um, the whole idea was around 66% grant funding, 33% of them. You may want to go 100% or 50-50. Um, could be for marketing, it could be for materials, it could be even for a little bit of labour to get things up and going again. Uh, I, I set something uh, as a concept around one to three thousand dollars, but um, of course, these are guidelines, so they can be um, um, can go up larger or smaller. Um, it's just to give an indication, um, and the Governance model is we'll get the working group to at least work through them and then present everything to council. Um, there is one component in the application form where we would black that out. Other than that, oh, we would put it in as a public document um, to do with people's turnover and impacts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the acquittal process I see is very simple. Really, they'll just return us very simple form. I haven't developed that form yet. Let's get to that point. Uh, saying they've actually complied with the rules, they've spent the money, and here's some evidence. So, um, not trying to make it too onerous, but there is obviously some level of accountability around it. Um, I have considered that it should be um, basically for those that are GST and. Um, Sorry, uh, ABN and GST registered, but uh, that may be an interesting point as well. But obviously, it's a business base for um, small to uh, micro um, organisations, and I and and when I drafted it, that might be up to as I said, ten employees with a couple of, couple of million dollars turnover. I think it was for memory. Um, so yeah, just looking for your input into. The tweaks, changes, updates, anything you'd like to put in, and then obviously it'll come to the next council meeting. Members, any questions or any further points of clarification that you're looking for? I failed to mention uh, Manager of Engineering, Steve Kaisler, is also joining the meeting. Um, anybody want to put an attention on to uh, Councillor Carla Wees? Um, yeah, no amendments from Maya and Martin. I just want to commend you on the work you've done there um, for, for both of the schemes. They look pretty good, um, straightforward, simple, which is what we want. We want it to be reasonably easy for people to apply for this. 
Thanks, Carla. I, I'm really of the opinion you're going to have to go again, but anyhow, let's see what we get, eh? Any further comments? Russ, uh, Russell? You're muted, mate. And Russell, if you can unmute. relying on my mute button um given what's taken place in melbourne how deep are our pockets to have a second go at this if we need be uh, I, I, <laughs> as i keep saying you've got a very strong balance sheet so you just go and borrow a little bit more money quite honestly i think you're gonna have to have another go 100 grand if you've got three thousand, that's only 30 grand um like I said, I've had half a dozen conversations in the last week. Um, yeah, not that I'm massive, but at least it's a little bit of help. Um, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, eh? Well, I'm already working on round two, as in uh, recovery plan v V2. So be prepared to throw another half a million at all this, I think. And you can do it, guys. You can. We're not – we're a very financial council. When we hit the really panic point, when I start panicking, then you should start panicking. We are okay. Oh, look, I'm just trying to make sure that we understand that this is not going to be, it's going to take a while to unwind. Uh, David DeVries? Well, if, uh, uh, if thanks, I could just Russia. clarify that. We've been oh, really okay. clear this is a one off program. We'll be really clear in the communications this is a one off program. Uh, David? Thanks, Your Worship. Yeah, look, um, I'm happy with everything. The only thing I would suggest is that um, we do monitor it as we go, and if we find that inadvertently we've managed to block people out or create some bureaucratic hurdle that they need to jump over, which is preventing them from accessing it, I just hope that we can uh, modify that as we go, if need be. Um, I've, I've seen this occur in the past where, um, look, with all the greatest will in the world, you know, often unintentional hurdles get put in people's way and I don't want to sort of add to people's frustration. So if we can just monitor that and if we find we're saying no a lot, um, that would be the the thing that I'd be looking at is why are we saying no? Is is, is it something that we've created or is it just it's not being properly uh, uh Maybe people are trying to access it for the wrong reasons, but if they are trying to access it for the right reasons and they're not being able to get through the system, I just hope that we can uh, monitor it and uh, modify as required. That was all. I think we've written it broadly enough, and the last dot point under 424 basically says, any other decent ideas? Yeah, so. and, and that's what I would hope. So long as we ad adopt the right spirit, I think everything will be fine. Well, that was easy. We did a good job. Well, it wasn't just me. There were many others. Over to you, Bim. Bim, you must be on mute. Okay, sorry, I'm coming back now. Uh, thanks for that. The next one will probably just follow in the same vein, uh, the community grant program. Anything particular that anyone wants to seek clarification or make comment with the community grant program? I, I guess there's two concepts I'd just like to quickly outline, Ben. Yep. Um, the community grant program is obviously for the purposes of COVID-19, but as members will remember with the uh, refund from the electricity, uh, successful electricity bid, is an additional $75,000 for the next two years in the community assistance program. So what we're trying to be really clear here, this is about COVID-19 and we'll point non-COVID-19 things to the community assistance program. I will say also, I don't think this is enough. Um, but again, maybe we'll review that as we go through the process and do another another release. Fifty thousand dollars if you got, you know, two thousand dollar. That's only two, you know, twenty five grants. So anyhow, we we can be flexible, like David said, and um, 
but yeah, the, the program's very similar, but pretty much everybody is able to apply. If they're not um, GST or ABN enabled, they could have somebody do it on their behalf, just like the community assistance scheme works. That's it, Ben. Okay. Anything further that anyone wants to add? If not, these items will come to the council meeting for um, adoption. Um, next item is 1.3 is the local government reform bill. Um, Martin's put some comments relative to his assessment along with the LGA's comments. Uh, do you want to expand any further, Martin, or has anyone got some comments they want to add at this point? I guess I'd just like to pick up something that obviously I used um, and group and build on the LGA. So um, the document you got from me sort of just said CEO comments and then I sent out the LGA document there on. You will see that I have an view that is probably a little bit more uh, green than perhaps the LGA is suggesting. Um, I will just highlight two concerns. Um, and after talking to the department and the minister as part of that reference group, um, the way the mechanism works for the rate oversight, so long as the rate oversight is based on providing high level data and not a full budget, um, administratively, you guys may have different views politically, but administratively it's doable. Um, and it was one of the main questions we all asked. If we have to produce a budget by the a full budget by the 31st of December, um, that's not doable without more resources. Absolutely not doable. We only finish financial year normally by late October. So then to produce another budget by the 31st of December is not doable. And absolutely had assurances from the department and the minister that that's not the intent. So we would look in the notes that I put there as just trying to refine any scope creep that happens within that part of the act over the next 20 years. Um, as to the concerns as administration around the rate oversight, I don't really have many. Um, I, I think if you're, you're running a sound ship, as I think in the main we do, um, the um, Proposal is better than the rate capping bill in that it is individual and um, um, addresses some of the concerns about the one size fits all. Um, and the only other one I would raise, which is the only one in my view that I put there as a red, is um, section 125 revisions. Um, I don't have an answer to that one, but it's just a concern about um, the regulation making power. And, but at the end of the day, regulations can be challenged back through the Parliament um, Oversight Committee. I've forgotten the name of it. Um, but again, that would be the only one I actually have some form of concern around. At the overall, I think um, the bill's pretty good. Uh, sorry, there is a third matter, um, which again, the CEO's group did raise. Um, it seems somewhat perverse that I could actually suspend a council member um, it's the equivalent of a manager suspending me. Um, that's been taken on board and understood. Um, I, I don't, I'm, fingers crossed this will never apply to the Barossa Council. We have robust debate. But, um, yeah, it just seems a little perverse that an employee can actually suspend their employer. Um, so that has been raised fairly generally in the, in the sector as well. Other than that, I think on the balance, it's actually not... Um, if, well, no, I shouldn't say it that. Way. I actually think it's a pretty damn good bill. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. David, and then Russell. David DeBreeze. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Yeah, look, um, when this initially came out, I was a little concerned. Um, but then when I started to look at the logistics of it, uh, if, if we were to have to get everything in by the end of the calendar year, and then they were supposed to... Uh, assess this and there are 68 councils which have to be assessed in detail uh, in a three-month period when we're talking about roughly 60 work days um, it became very obvious that there's just no way that, that this logistically could have been handled so uh, my view is that, that the intent clearly is that 
it's a little bit like the uh, ATO. They only audit those people I think need to be audited and the rest they tend to, you know, let through pretty much on the nod. So I suspect, as uh, uh, Stefan has said to us in the past, we're not the type of council that uh, the government has their eye on. So I suspect this won't have a, a big influence over, over uh, our forward planning. Russell? I guess we'll get the opportunity to comment when the LGA seeks a response from us, but um, based on personal experience, I uh, would express some concerns about the potential for a Minister of the Crown to um, reach into your business through directives that may actually ask you to act ultra-virously. So I think it's something that uh, we need to keep an eye on. So, you, you know, sovereign overreach is, is a thing and it does happen and it has consequences for budgets. So I just, just urge that the LGA at least pays attention to that. And uh, the second part escapes me for the moment. I'll come back if I can remember it. Just if I could comment that yep. the thing to recognise in the local government, the minister has the right already to make uh, directions and instructions, and it is, it's there. Um, and if if you're doing your best and responding appropriately, the risk's pretty low. Well, I think I think the LGA are right to be cautious. Um, the second part was the consultation timing is interesting because it, it, it always ends up with this juxtaposition with Christmas and the opportunity for actually getting proper feedback from the community around Christmas time is nil. So you can actually end up with quite a, um, a log jam in there. Uh, I just, I'll interject the end, sorry. So no, the consultation will still follow the same process. So obviously the designated authority has three months to provide advice on what we have to submit in terms of the data, which will mainly be long-term financial plan data. Then after that, you have to include it in your consultation document and any response. So the, the, the assurances we've received are the budget processes won't change significantly. So we'll still be consulting in around a May, about a May period. Thank you. Any further? comments that anyone wants to make? Very good. Thanks for that. That's a good overview and clarified some of the points, you know, that we all sort of were looking at. And yeah, I sort of briefly caught up with uh, the minister last week and uh, and he expanded on some of the things that Martin sort of talked about. So that's all good. Uh, tree management. Uh, Matt, Matt Elding. Yes, good evening, yeah. Sue. I'll just, just bring up the, I'll, I'll just oh. bring it up, Matt. Sorry, hang on. I've hit the wrong button now. Hang on. Okay, members, do you have that in front of you? Yes. Right. Okay, okay thanks, Matt. Yeah, we you can need just go, go to, to page slide. one. Just the first page, Martin, if you could um, scroll back. That's it. Thank you. So, just a snapshot of the services we provide to the community. Uh, so as part of our tree management, um, we uh, we have a crew that does uh, tree maintenance, internal uh, work crew of about uh, four staff uh, with a dedicated project officer. And that's our crews, you can see climbing the tree there, that's a skill they have. Uh, for the more high risk activities, we have external contractors and that's an image from uh, Tananda Oval where they're removing the uh, bunion nuts from that uh, from that tree. Uh, next slide, thanks. So back in 2018, we conducted an audit of our main street trees, and really this came about uh, because of the high nature or the high volume of reactive 
uh, work orders. So we're seeing a lot of the trees in the area fail. And it was a direction from council at the time to uh, look at being uh, more proactive and uh, get some data on these trees. So that's what we did. We did the tree audit and that's where we looked at. We focused on the main streets of each township across the region uh, and we assessed each individual tree. So each tree, next time you're walking past, you'll see it has a silver tag on it. So that way we can um, correlate that back to a report that was done at the time. And that gives us information. Uh, next slide, thanks, Martin. Um, that gives us information on the tree. It, it tells us the, um, it, it's a quantified risk assessment. So it says what is likely to fail, um, how big is something if it's likely to come down and what it's likely to hit when it comes down. And that's essentially what that risk assessment says. And then it gives us some advice on how or what the age of the tree is and uh, what its expected life is. And so from that, we've developed a work program. And and, um, and the next photo is just a, an example of the tag that's on all, aluminium tag that's on all the trees. Um, and so from that, we've developed a work program. We increased our budgets. So we have around uh, 230,000 in wages, 200 in contractors, again, to do the, uh, the high stuff, the risk riskier things, things we just can't get to. We've got 30,000 to purchase new trees, uh, 20,000 for an elevated work platform for the high stuff, and then uh, some money for uh, whole preparation and planting, which includes service location, back truck, and then planting. It, it's it's uh, not a simple exercise to plant a tree in the ground. We have to ensure there's no services there, particularly Telstra. So that program is focused on the Main Street trees, and uh, we've probably got about two years left remaining on that. Um, <clears throat> the next uh, for next financial year, uh, we will be focusing um, on the main street in Tanunda to remove those aged trees. Um, there's uh, perhaps we'll go to the next slide, Martin. Sorry, Matt. Can I just comment that that is yep. just the street tree budget. That doesn't include the rural work, doesn't it? So no. Nelly so with. That's right. With the rural work, what we tend to do, so if we, at the moment, we're out there uh, preparing for next year's re-sheet program, so we're out there clearing the road so that we can go through and commence um, the re-sheeting activities uh, with the vegetation uh, already uh, cleared. And there's also, uh, as part of it is for the re-sheet, but also uh, the second part of that is clearing the roads for our stock routes. So we have a envelope that we clear to as part of our vegetation management plan. It's a diptic guideline. Uh, that we have to provide clearance uh, clearance envelope uh, on our rural roads for trees. So that's also part of that activity. Um, uh, David, so you, uh, yeah. David uh, Habeck, has a, do you want to jump in with a question, uh, David, or are you happy to let Matt finish? Yeah, perhaps if Matt finishes first, then I've got a couple of questions. Okay, go for it, Matt. Uh, so as I said, we've got probably around two years to go, and we've been focusing uh, from that audit on... Uh, infill and replacement, so not new plantings. Um, we've extended this audit out to our reserves and we've made great progress there. We've got um, Stockwell Rec Park remaining. And the result of this work is, uh, I, I hope you've, uh, you've, you, you would have noticed that uh, you would have seen a lot of trees planted um, and we've significantly reduced those reactive failures uh, in terms of our customer requests. So we're getting a, a step ahead of the customers. I mean, we used to rely on the customers ringing up to say a limb's fallen down. Uh, and now with this work, we're, we're a, a step ahead in the most part. We still get the storms that we need to react to, but in the most part, we're ahead of the curve. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned before, the next priority is to the Tanunda Main Street. Um, there's an, quite a number of trees. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is just a an aerial um, that I had put together just to give you an example. And there's a number of these sheets which I'll provide at an appropriate time um, as part of our consultation for this. Uh, there's 48 trees that need to be removed that are aged, um, are dying or significantly uh, on their way to dying. And there's a cost of around $80,000 by the time we um, tender that out to contractors uh, because uh, we want that done quickly and efficiently. Uh, and then also the preparation, the whole preparation and replanting that needs to be done as a follow through. Uh, so that's the next priority. And the next steps from there might be once we've completed this, we'll then be, OK, where do we expand this work to? There's a number of other significant avenues of trees that we haven't assessed as part of this. We've focused on the main streets. 
Um, so that uh, that would likely be, uh, you know, a, a segue into uh, where to from here. Happy to take questions. Cook Street David. looks good. Uh, David Habeck. Yes, I'm probably the person to blame for all this, but then again, what I'm looking for, I would like to discuss is that I think we need a, a plan that covers all the uh, council area, um, including Nims Town, Mount Pleasant, um, Lindock and so forth. And, and, we've, and Matt's spoken about um, Stockwell, but there's the streets within the towns other than the main streets. And I've noticed that the trees here in the main street and other towns have been done, which is excellent. But I think we've got a way to go Every time I drive around, I can see dead trees. And uh, there's a couple of parks even here without even looking too far uh, with dead trees in them. So I don't know whether Matt can organise something for his people that when they're out emptying the bins in some of these parks to have a look around and they'll see the dead trees. And uh, just a few things like that to bring brings up to scratch. But I also believe that um, a lot of the... Um, reserves need a looking at as well and uh, need looking at as well so but as i say i think we're going down the right track and uh, but i'd like to see a plan that goes on for the next number of years because trees will need to be replaced as every year goes on and if some haven't died this year they'll die the following year so we need a plan i think that's all i like to say at this stage Thank you. So, Ben, I guess my response to that is we can absolutely do a plan over the whole area, but that is going to be extremely significant. I mean, dealing with reacts is not a problem, David, but it doesn't mean that we've got the money necessary to replace that tree. So um, the previous direction was to focus, like Matt said, on the main streets and then expand, 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 expand. And this is going to be a 10, 20, 30 year program of continuing to update data and then update programs if we are to accelerate it then that's a that's a outcome of budget thanks uh russell and then david yeah, Bruce. just a quick comment about the removal of 48 trees in the main street of Sananda. will we have a kind of a community uh educational process around that we'll have to do an announce and defend somehow so that's going to be nice and tricky uh, absolutely that's the plan yes i need to first inform uh, the elected body of what the proposed approach is and then we need to um, communicate to, to the community as to uh, why we're doing it, what is planned to be done why it needs to be done um, and uh, explain the process yeah absolutely if i can have a supplemental your worship yep um what role for some of the concepts in water sensitive urban design to make sure that we direct some stormwater into um, these trees as a part of the, the stormwater management process. Thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, there's been some relatively new concepts that have been developed in terms of, um, uh, and I'm not sure where it's at in terms of implementation. I think there's been some trials done. I've been reading um, online uh, with neighbouring councils where uh, there's a device that's been uh, designed, an innovation that uh, brings uh, street water or curb, curb and water table water and directs it into a into a tree. Uh, I don't know what stage that at, that's at. I've just sort of picked up on a few articles in my feed on that. Um, but certainly there's innovations now out there where they're looking to bring some of that uh, street water into the tree. So I'm just following it in the background and we'll bring it to you when I get uh, some more details on that. Thanks, Matt. David DeVries. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. As uh, Your Worship would know, and I'm sure Matt's going to start smiling, um, uh, Matt and I and, and Ben went out uh, around Tanunda to have actually cite every one of these trees, and uh, I can assure everybody that uh, uh, as a real tree hugger myself, I was uh, – really put Matt through his feet to the fire on every one of them, but uh, I'm, I'm convinced, unfortunately, that they all do need to go. Um, this this process, uh, David, um, is something that I guess we've been working on for some time. Uh, we 
for me, I was uh, it was those trees in the northern end of Tanunda up by the uh, Kramers Crossing that were starting to die as a result of the um, the droughts uh, prior to the last election and, and even beyond before that, um, where we basically didn't have a tree register. And this was something that was concerning me enormously because it felt like we were allowing trees that maybe didn't need to die to, to, to die through neglect. Um, and so a heck of a lot of work has been done uh, to go from basically where we were very much responsive to actually now in a more proactive manner. And I agree with uh, Martin that um, the, the goal always was to target the, the main street trees first because they were the, the, the high visible ones and they were the ones that affect the, the vast majority of people and then broaden out from there. And like you, I'd like to see more done. Um, and if we can increase the budget, I'd, I'd, I'd be all in favour of that. But um, this is one of the things that's just been teased out from the process. So. Uh, yeah, Russell, we're definitely, um, I've already started talking to people in Tanunda about this. A lot of trees in Tanunda have actually, as you're probably aware, in, in uh, Bidyara Road. Um, I think we're talking, Matt, about um, Bassadar Road. There's a few there that need attention as well. And the community seem to be reasonably okay with it, providing we act quickly and we replace the ones that are ripped out as soon as possible. My own street here of Cook Street in Tanunda literally uh, I think almost all of the trees had, had were dying or about to die. Um, and in the end, the, the most cost effective thing to do was rip out the remainder. And it's a bit like ripping out all the teeth and replacing them with falsies. Um, the job's not complete, but it's uh, it's it's down merely. And, and while the, the, the street will take time to regain anything like its, its former look, um, it's been allowed to deteriorate a very long period of time. And I think most of the people in the street as ex have accepted that the reality of what's happening. So, yeah, I think people will be very sad to see these trees go. Some of them are obvious. Some are really clear that they need to be replaced. There are a few that are tagged, which at first blush look like, why would you rip that out? But they all do have structural issues, which uh, for safety and for long term health need to be addressed. So I just thought I'd put that out there. And also for any members of the community listening in, I promise you this was not something that we've taken uh, lightly. And I, I fought long and hard to make sure that only the absolutely worst trees that have to come out will come out. Um, there will be a hell of a lot of the trees still remaining, which is good. And I think this is part of a long term strategy that needs to be employed. Thanks, Your Worship. Don, Don Barrett, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I've got about to uh, about three dot points uh, and the first one as this is such a long-term project and I'm asking the question out a bit of a bit of ignorance is there any potential for us to grow these trees through the bush gardens um, uh, it just seems as this is a such a long-term project or or are we locked into a place like Fleming's or Manor Nurseries here in South Australia uh, to get these specialist trees uh, that's the, the first one the next one, uh, next dot point I've got uh, written down as I go through these questions in my mind is um, have we considered any of these avenues of trees through uh, memorials? Because I know around here in Mount Pleasant, we've got one particular street and every tree uh, in that particular street uh, is a memorial. So it's not quite as easy as just ripping it out because it's um, dead and dying. Um, there's actually something quite significant behind them and the uh, 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 got to read my writing here um, uh, the type of trees uh, and it relates back to bush gardens is that just uh, uh, indigenous trees only or um, are we just looking at um, um, deciduous trees of Europe European type nature so they're my dot points thanks Matt yeah, if I respond to that, um, yes. in terms of uh, replacement of trees, yes, we, we do work uh, collaboratively with the bush gardens. So, for example, the bush gardens collect and harvest uh, pods from the carob trees and they then uh, propagate those uh, carob trees into um, into uh, well, into small trees that we then take and plant. It's a very slow process. We've had trouble procuring carob trees. Uh, so it's something that the bush gardens are doing for us, recognising that it's difficult for us to source mature carob trees. So that's ongoing. That's now set in place, and there's a commitment from the bush gardens to do that. The avenue of trees and memorials, uh, I haven't had to deal with that directly. I had uh, in, I think it's Memorial Avenue in, in uh, Newry, where, where there was a, um, 
not a, a direct link, but there was uh, an indirect link to those trees um, coming back from uh, a, one of the Great Wars. Um, so we, we met with the community on that street to uh, work out a way forward and how we're going to take those down. And something, an outcome out of that was that they were using some of the wood as, um, uh, you know, they were going to take some of that wood and do something with it. Uh, and there was a couple of actions we, we took from that. Um, so again, it's about consulting with the community on those, in those cases, sort of by exception. Uh, and the types of trees, it's really um, what we tend to focus on is a like for like for replacement. So if a carob was there, the carob goes back. Um, and it tends to be more the exotic trees uh, that we focus on because they are where the main avenues of trees are, are planted with either ash, carobs, um, or the, or the, uh, or the ornamental manchurian pears, for example. Thank you, Matt. Much appreciated. I, I might just add that also with any new street tree planting, there is a requirement under the Local Government Act to consult with the adjoining property owners. It, it doesn't mean that they get to pick the trees, but you, you do have those conversations just to get a feel for what people want in front of their houses. Cathy uh, Troop, Councillor Troop. Well, um, Don asked the exact same questions I wanted to ask. So you've actually asked everything. I was just concerned um, that, um, you know, that we're focusing on Australian natives rather than, you know, imported ones so that we attract our local birds and fauna and those sort of things. And also I just attended a greening session um, and uh, the work that the Adelaide Council are doing is exactly what David said with the stormwater and how they're actually channeling their water and avoiding all the, you know, the, obviously they've got more infrastructure underneath, but it was quite fascinating. So, and um, is there any potential that we could possibly um, work more with the bush gardens to produce other um, uh, plants that possibly would be suitable besides just the carob tree? Yeah, that's always a possibility. I mean, if we need a, a, a gum, a river, river red gum, um, we, we can source that from the, the bush garden. So that's really readily available. But it's um, uh, their priority, I guess, is to is to um, grow and nurture those native varieties, uh, not so much the exotic. So if we want a Manchurian pear, I think our, we're always going to be best placed going to a commercial nursery for that. Yeah. I was just going to add a similar thought that um, the original thought because um, it predates Matt, was carob trees are very difficult to get and to grow them out over many years was an economic uh, decision, ultimately, um, whereas commercial product, we're better off yeah, going commercially. Uh, David, you've got another question, then John Angus and Cathy Schilling. David, Havik. Yeah, just going on from Dave DeVere's, uh, I was going to bring up, Kirk Street, uh, Dave, and uh, just say how well it looks. Uh, the trees that we've planted there are crepe myrtle and manchurian pears. And I can say that once they grow, I know those trees, once they grow in a few years' time, that street will look absolutely beautiful. And I'd encourage people, even councillors, to go there and have a look. And you'll see what, even now that they've just been planted, what the street can look like in 10, 20 years' time. I also... Uh, say that we should be uh, considering more to do with the bush gardens. I would have liked to put some more money there as far as the uh, as far as the uh, drought assistance goes, because I think that's where we're coming from. Um, they can do a lot um, for uh, even if it's uh, additional types of trees. And I think Matt, we might have to look at what trees we do need and and really focus on them. So uh, I think that's a good idea. Also, uh, the more trees we replant, the more cost it's going to be to cancel, and we have to recognise that because these trees have to be watered. Once the trees are 20, 30 years old, the roots are down into the ground and they seep the water out of the ground themselves. But when they're young, they need to be watered. So council's going to be up for extra costs there, and uh, that's just part of the whole deal. But let's keep on moving along. Thank you. Just in response to that, we we are, and I forgot to mention, we are running a full-time water cart at the moment. So it's one resource, virtually full-time watering trees. Kathy, uh, Kathy Schilling. Oh, sorry, no, John Angus, and then Kathy. Thanks, Bim. 
uh, I don't want to be the pariah, but um, I suggest that we don't make a rod for our own back by planting trees in memory of people. If other people want to do it, that's fine. But if we plant trees as a memorial to someone, um, however significant, when the time comes for that tree to be removed, we're just making a problem for ourselves. If someone else has taken the initiative and done it, that's fine. Just save ourselves the grief. Thank, uh, Kathy. Um, yeah, this might be a different conversation for a different time, but my um, observations are more to do with um, our parks and gardens and um, plantings in those regions. Um, for instance, in Europe, about, around about the year 2000, so 20 years ago, we did um, a number of plantings along the Linear Park um, precinct with natives and a lot of those are starting now to look very tired because as you know, natives don't have a very long, some of them don't have a very long lifespan. And I just wondered, is there, um, do we have a plan or are we looking at doing a plan for our parks and gardens in our towns as well? Uh at, not at this stage. I mean, as as I said, the focus has been on the main streets. Um, the rec parks have been prioritised with, you know, particularly with the big project work that's been happening as well. Um, you know, that's something that needs to be considered is the parks, uh, the remaining parks and gardens um, and our approach in there. Um, can I just add that, you know, in the past we've used Trees for Life or I know Chris Hall was very a significant player in getting a lot of those plantings in Linear Park done. So, you know, uh, is there an opportunity for us to tap into Trees for Life or any of those other organisations um, to assist us with some of the parks and gardens? Uh, look, possibly. The current commitment to Trees for Life is through our uh, Bush for Life sites, uh, which Council pays a contribution, annual contribution to, and um, uh, the Trees for Life or Bush for Life is the program that's run. There's six sites around the region of the Barossa that are uh, Trees for Life manage the volunteers and manage those sites. And, you know, we uh, we support that by paying that annual fee plus uh, doing any reactive work um, that comes out of that. So they might report um, fencing that needs replacement or uh, vandalism or illegal dumping or um, spoil that needs to be moved. That's how we support that current program. Um, but that... In terms of planting in our, um, uh, you know, linear park, um, it's not something I can answer at the moment. I need to, to look into that, what's been done historically and how we can approach that moving forward. Thank you. Uh, David DeVries. Uh, thank you, Worship. Yeah, just a, a, few, a few comments just to follow up. Um, one of the things about the main street trees, I'm a big fan of this idea of planting uh, like with like. I know there's been talk at different times within different towns about the idea of uh, quote unquote more appropriate or different uh, species. The trouble with that is that once you start doing that, unless you're willing to rip out every tree in the main street and start from scratch, the process of converting from one species to another will take approximately 100 years. And so it's not going to happen within our lifetime, our children's lifetime or our grandchildren's lifetime or maybe a grandchildren's lifetime. So um, I'm not a big fan of doing that unless there's this huge um, outpouring of community uh, desire to see that. But most people, I think, are kind of happy with it. By the way, the Caribs, as I understand it, there's links with Palestine and World War One there. So I'd, I'd, I'd be very cautious about playing with that. Um, I totally agree with John in regards to the memorials. Uh, the moment you make a tree the symbol of a human being, um, the fate of that, tree then becomes the fate of that family's love and I think that's a very dangerous situation to put ourselves in. And I noticed uh, Councillor Hearn was uh, grinning away about uh, um, Cook Street. I'd just like to point out that I think at the time that we talked about this, Cook Street by far was the worst, not the best, but the worst street regarding trees. I think we were down to something like 50% of the trees over the last five years, Tony, just so you're aware, had been ripped out and had been capped. And the talk of doing the street has been on the books for probably about five years and was being uh, consulted by the, 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 the street itself prior to the last election. That's how long this process has been going on. So, 
if anybody thinks that I was uh, flexing my council councillor muscles, I can assure you, if I was, I was doing a pretty poor job of it because that could have been done a lot quicker. Thank you, no, Your Worship. Yeah, I had a no, look at I that. Think Tony was uh, giving me a, a little bit of a smirk. That's all right. I love you, Tony. I just sent you a message, Tony. Um, thanks, um, um, Gary. So, uh, pipe in there about the bush gardens. Uh, obviously, uh, we we do support uh, a works in, uh, team in terms of providing those plants. Obviously, going forward, we'd love to continue to grow more plants uh, for council. Uh, but obviously, the efforts of the bush gardens is actually highly reliant on our volunteers. The actual pricking and collection of seeds and, and plants is uh, pretty much done by our volunteers. So our ability to produce plants is very much dependent on the number of volunteers that we have at any one time. Uh, obviously, there's seasonal impacts uh, in terms of uh, pest and disease, etc. And just the whole COVID-19 has actually limited our production this season. So we're going to actually see a, a shortage of plants, not only for uh, council, but for our community nursery. So. Yeah, resourcing is a is a difficult part for us at Bush Gardens, but we'd love to continue to work with Matt's team. Thanks for that. Um, I guess just in summarising and historically looking at it, uh, I think I think we've progressed with the last council and with this council quite considerably with our better management of the trees than what. And, and I'll I'll. Uh, I'll take a hit that back then we was struggling to do very much with the trees for many years ago, but it's now come to the forefront. I guess the issue relating to uh, what's the best street trees, um, you know, <laughs> my personal view is native trees don't make good street trees. They're, they're good in our parks and gardens, but uh, uh, but look, I and, and I think the memorial stuff, which um, um, Matt touched on and Don, you touched on too, was was important there is there is those still those historic sites around and whatever we do we just got to be conscious of that and i agree with john we shouldn't start <laughs> introducing more memorial trees we'll just deal with the ones we got when they pop up sort of thing so but look there's far more money going into into the tree management than what we've been able to put there in the past and, and i guess as we keep on working with uh, these issues and developing it further and fine tuning it it'll it'll, it'll only improve even more so. Uh, Kathy Schilling. Of um, yeah, just going back to um, like reserves within the town streets and um, there's a number of situations where there's local residents are actually maintaining those gardens. Have we got any policy around um, local, you know, residents maintaining uh, street reserves and that type of thing? Yeah, look, um, it, if, if residents are active in terms of uh, gardening, they sh they need to be registered as a volunteer with council. There's a number of reasons for that. Is one so we can coordinate that work, so we can work in collaboration together, so we're not um, uh, conflicting. And the, and the second one is in terms of insurance to ensure that um, they're doing things safely and and they're covered uh, themselves for insurance because they are working on council land. So without that, um, the, the um, uh, I guess the answer is there shouldn't be any any uh, work on council land without having a uh, been a, a volunteer of council and being covered under that insurance because that's then covered under the section 221 of the act where you're not to alter a, uh, a road a roadside at all without the authority of council. Thank I guess you. what I'd add there, Kathy, is um, if there are interested groups, it's not difficult to go through the process and then. Um, you know, they are covered and they are safe and they're working on um, good outcomes for everyone. So we've got lots of them. There's lots of them around, absolutely, that are registered and doing various uh, greening programs. OK, thanks for that. Um, and, and I'm just picking up on that previous comment that Martin made and, and Matt touched on. Our, our rural road network is quite extensive. And to main, maintain that um, um, corridor is is quite significant as far as uh, 
keeping the clearance back beyond the, the white posts and making sure you've got the height uh, for the various stock trucks traveling through. So there's there's quite a lot more to tree management that, and granted the street trees and all of those things in our main street are critical, uh, but the urban design and the water sensitive strategies are, are coming to the forefront with, with that. But with all of that, there's, there's additional uh, cost and materials it it pays off in the long run, but it just means you can't do as much as you want all the time, but you do it properly when we do it. And I, I think Matt and the boys are now got that pretty well nutted with the replanting programs that I've seen go in are far better than what we've previously done in the past, that's for sure. Thank you. I, I think the other important point, I, I did actually promise Matt to get the figures, but I ran out of time. We spend about another six hundred thousand dollars on the rural network as well. We we spend overall about one point one million dollars a year on street trees and rural trees. Trees, yeah, yep. Very good. Okay. Um, nothing further on that one. We'll look at the uh, school precinct item. I'll just share it again, Mr. Mayor. Hang on a tick. Thank you. Hey, you got it? Yep. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, well, uh, ultimately defer to Steve for this one, but um, this this is in response to, you know, we've, we've had uh, multiple requests and they're outlined in the presentation from the community to do something in, uh, in this uh, area. So we've undertaken um, a, a, an audit of that space and we've come uh, to some recommendations for that. Now, there's currently uh, further correspondence from Faith Lutheran College, from the, the board of that school, uh, not satisfied with their initial response. So there needs to be uh, further um, discussions with the school uh, to drive this, uh, I guess, to bring this to a close. But I'll hand over to Steve to go through the details. He's the one that's been uh, doing the road safety audit. He's accredited road safety auditor with uh, with DIPTI, so he's best placed to respond to this. Thanks, Steve. Um, thanks, Matt. And through you, the Mayor. We have received a number of components of correspondence over the years. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please, Martin. Thank you. Some of the correspondence is from private people, but it still relates to the school communities. Uh, the Tanunda Primary School and the Faith Lutheran College School and the Magnolia and Research Road areas. Um, there is a wide range of expectations uh, in terms of what council should provide at these locations. And the next slide, however, summarises what has been expressed in the correspondence to date. In addition to the three components that are listed there, there's also periphery items that, uh, um, that, that, that can be listed and create a little bit of a long list, but a, a less minor, or a more minor, less major. I think the emotional value that is attached to safety around school zones is important to parents, it's important for students, and it warrants perhaps a little bit of an explanation now as to what some of the devices are that council can actually install. And so here we go now, just a little bit of a whirlwind tour through the traffic control devices that can be placed on roads, and in particular roads around schools. And it's important to get a little bit of a grasp as to what can and can't be installed before we can actually move forward. Firstly is um, there's the minimum level of device provided at a school is the school zone. That's denoted by the zigzag white line on the road. That can only be placed at the location of a school for the extent of the school and not beyond. It designates where the school is. And with that zone, traffic is required to travel at 25 kilometres per hour or less if children are present, whether it be school time or not school time. That's the minimum level of uh, designation provided at any school. Of interest is that the school zone can't be placed at kindergartens or child care centres uh, because they rationally would not have students crossing the road on their own, uh, be with adults. I've put on the same page here the highest level that can be provided, the pedestrian actuated crossing. For example, the crossing that we have at Nuriup to High School. 
I've added this in because it does provide the safest level of crossing. Clear designation for pedestrians and also um, vehicles on a cyclic basis as need is required. Uh, they obviously operate effectively and are mainly installed when there is an appropriate warrant and it's usually high traffic numbers and high pedestrian numbers. Of note, and this is why it's on the same page, of note is that when you have a pedestrian activated crossing, the school zone disappears. That one to the left disappears and the 50 kilometre per hour designation applies for uh, transfer of traffic in an easy and unrestricted way. Next slide, please. These are the only two children's crossings. Now, it sounds a little bit like a zoo from here on in. Uh, the first one is the emu crossing with the flags and the second is the koala crossing uh, with flashing lights. Uh, of note is the emu crossing can only be located within a school zone and a school zone of course I've described can only be located adjacent or a short distance in front of the school. With both of these crossings there are uh, specific warrants. The highest of the warrants is for the koala crossing. As you would expect, there needs to be quite large numbers of children crossing in excess of 50 children uh, at a given point in time in the day. There's less restricted warrants for the emu crossing, but it still is required to be located at, a, at the school. And it needs to be demonstrated at least that it will be used. They're the two school children's crossings. The next slide highlights a number of other crossings that are more directly related to uh, public safety in other regions. The first one's the zebra crossing, which is on a flat road surface. And the second one is a glorified zebra crossing, really, which we call a wombat crossing. It has a raised surface. Uh, you can see there that the line marking applies and uh, the raised platform uh, provides uh, an extra level of designation for approaching traffic. Both of these crossings can only be used where the traffic is uh, 30 kilometres to 40 kilometres in a precinct orientation. They require extra lighting and extra infrastructure uh, because of their uh, pedestrian priority related use. Any pedestrian walks out onto the road, they get priority and they're dangerous, more, more, more dangerous on those terms that the traffic needs to understand what they're for. And lastly, there is the two components that we have mostly around this area. There's curb ramps and the pedestrian refuge ramps and pedestrian refuge island that, for example, that we've used in Gawler Street. These are not crossings. These are not pedestrian crossings or school crossings. They provide uh, safe designated locations where pe people can cross and there's a distinct difference there in that they um, provide at least a location that cars can identify as the most likely place where a pedestrian will be expected. So let's come back to the uh, schools. We use the three tools that are provided by the Australian standards and the guidelines from the Department of Road Transport and the Australian Road Rules uh, to determine what might be able to be placed and done in Magnolia, just to provide a greater level of safety. With all of these, there's a national approach such that wherever you go in Australia, wherever you come across a device that you've just seen in the previous slides, you would uh, reasonably expect to use it in the same way, whether it be in the Barossa or in Sydney. So on the next slide, there are a number of observations that council and uh, numerous council staff observed on three separate days at the peak afternoon period. And, um, and a data-driven approach is what's definitely required to determine the next steps. Of note is that the pedestrian numbers that use the footpaths and, ro and, and road crossings are essentially low relative to other areas. The numbers are listed there for the, and the peak hour is really our peak 15 minutes. Uh, there's about 15 to 20 children that use the designated footpaths either on foot or on bike approximately eight to 10 children crossed Magnolia Road at given locations. Uh, given, uh, firstly, this 
eight to ten children crossed at the uh, curb ramps at the wrecks and five elsewhere numerously along the length of Magnolia Road. But of interest is that safe behaviours were generally observed. In terms of vehicle uh, behaviours, there was, of course, the expected higher vehicles coming out of Research Road onto Magnolia Road, again for that 15 to 20 minute peak period. There was queuing, as would be expected. The waiting time was one to three minutes, uh, perhaps longer for a few minutes at a time. But again, generally compliant behaviours were observed. Um, of the crossings that we had previously looked at, um, there, based on those observations, there would be little warrant for the pedestrian crossings that might otherwise be expected from some of the school community. So in other words, road rules apply and speed enforcement from uh, SA or the South Australian Police would apply to make sure that the traffic and pedestrians act in a reasonable manner. Um, moving forward, and this, this uh, has been expected expressed at least in part to the school community but will be expressed and discussed further in a consultative way in terms of the most recent correspondence that Matt uh, mentioned earlier. The most reasonable way forward would be first in a stepwise sense but first to complete the footpath connectivity in Magnolia Road. On the north side of Magnolia past the Rex for example the footpath disappears into the Rex across the car park across to the um, the uh, tree plantings behind, it would be reasonable to reconstruct the, the new footpath adjacent to Magnolia Road for the complete length of Magnolia Road adjacent to the Rex. And likewise, in the southern road of Magnolia Road, there is a piece of footpath missing down just past Karen Drive across the railway line on the south side. The footpath exists on the north there, but on the south side it's missing and so pedestrians do cross the road there to get back to the footpath that exists. So the completion of the footpath would be reasonable. Another point of uh, improvement would be to ensure that there is a sense of traffic management by way of understood traffic loops. This works successfully in other locations across the state and to a degree is already happening at these locations. The first loop for the primary school would be to suggest all traffic, best as possible, uh, without it being compulsory, but all traffic use the loop that goes up Magnolia, then to research down Vinevale and to then access the new Cromer Crossing roundabout that now creates a safe connectivity back Mingi Road to the school and to the townships of Tanunda and Uri and beyond. I know that the Faith School currently operate a loop within the school as they go up Magnolia, they connect internally in the school to reactivate uh, the connection back to Magnolia Road. And I'll come back to Nildner just briefly at the end. Um, lastly, in terms of uh, successful pedestrian management to engage with DIPTI in their Way to Go program, other schools, including Europe to Primary School, have successfully engaged with safe pedestrian and traffic movements there. There's a good deal of consultation that uh, happens through DIPTI with the school, both with the parents, students and the teachers to ensure that there's a reasonable sense of engagement and uh, result at the end of that. They will uh, include council within that. So the last slide highlights perhaps the, oh it does, it highlights the components of footpath that council staff had proposed as a possible future capital works program to complete the footpath to ensure that the children have least necessity to cross the road, those two locations. Um, the existing location of the Rex crossing is shown and perhaps the possible additional pedestrian curb ramp location shown down further south to create a slower zone precinct speed, the roadside friction alone would help slow the traffic down, but only that second curb ramp would only perhaps be constructed if it was demonstrated there was a need. Perhaps now coming back to some of the initial expectations of the Faith and Tanunda school community, they did mention that they required or requested additional um, 
traffic control devices at Alf Pellegrini. You can see Alf Pellegrini there coming off of Magnolia, and Martin will circle that with his arrow. Well done, Martin. The traffic coming out there is very low. Of the days that we were there, it was one car on one day. And generally, the students activated uh, good behaviours there as well. It wasn't perceived to be a problem. Not to say that there are not problems at particular point in times, just that they weren't observed on the three days that we were there. And lastly, uh, they requested a connection using the traffic management loop principle for traffic to come out of faith and to connect up via Neldner Road to the area south of Tanunda. Uh, that would form a new initiative at a future budget. I don't need to discuss that here, apart from the fact that Neldner Road, and it is in Neldner Road in its own right, only carries about 90 vehicles per day at the moment, which again is low, and it is currently maintained at the level of service that is appropriate for those uh, traffic numbers. Over to you for questions through you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Steve. Uh, David, uh, uh, David DeVries. Not, not so much. Yep. yep. You hear me? Carry on. No. Yep. Got yep. you now. Yep. Yeah. Not so much a question, more a comment. Um, Council Miller Moss, actually, before I, I, I do say this, uh, just one question, Steve. When did you actually do the uh, uh, the observations? What period was that? Like what month? No, oh, that was in February. It was prior to shutdown, but in uh, a normal working week of the school. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, look, uh, the uh, the ramps that you've uh, designated there, um, I uh, I think are, are, are a good choice. Um, in fact, uh, when when I was actually on site with Councillor Miller and then later on with the mayor, um, we looked at precisely those those options, and I think they are um, well worth a look. Uh, I think the ramp, which is on the western side of um, the car park uh, outside the Rex. Um, that ramp crossing would be useful simply because I, yet while I absolutely agree that on the northern side the, the we should see a continuation of the footpath, that footpath does intersect with the entrances and exits out of the, the wrecks and that ramp crossing would then enable students to basically walk on the southern side of the road which is not being intersected by cars um, and from what we witnessed a lot of the students were sort of walking down there um, and that would then prevent, well, not prevent them, but would give them an alternative to actually crossing at the northern, uh, sorry, at the more eastern end by the wrecks itself, which would then mean that you're, you're keeping the kids away from uh, the, the the wrecks, you're keeping them away from the car park. And basically what they were all doing was basically crossing at the wrecks by the car park and then cutting through the car park, um, at least certainly were in my, my observation. And so I think that that ramp just to the west of the car park entrance where the traffic naturally slows down because it's close to the intersection, or close-ish to this intersection, would be a very good option. Um, I know I've been banging on about Neldner Road, um, and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't uh, bring this up again. Um, I agree with you that the loop, um, which goes up, or if you like, to the east along, um, uh, which basically would take in the Tanunda Primary School side of Magnolia Road, goes round in, in a complete loop, I think is, is a very good idea. When uh, I was there speaking to the um, the school um, principal and and people there, they agreed that they would be keen to encourage that from occur encourage that to occur, and I think that would be excellent. Um, the faith uh, group were they would like Neldner Road to be sealed because then you would have a second loop, but this the two would then be on completely separate sides of the road, which would be basically meaning that the uh, the Tanunda Primary would go up along uh, basically to the east and then do a circle basically a anti-clockwise circle that way and then on the other side of the road you would then have a, a a completed loop where you don't have to have people crossing the road and so forth for uh faith so i agree that if we were just looking at Neldner road in isolation in terms of the people who live on that road itself we can't justify um any change in its status it, that is probably the correct well it is the correct status for that but um if it was then part of a loop which was actually uh there for that purpose i think one of the benefits would be that you would then 
uh, reduce the amount of traffic you'd have actually going through the east, uh, through the intersection, Magnolia, Mangy Road intersection heading east. Um, and I think that would be to the benefit. It would basically smooth out and even out the traffic. And it would, I think, then reduce the impact on, on that Magnolia Road, Mangy Road intersection. So I think as part of a broader strategy, I still believe Neldner Road is a good choice. Um, that's just purely an opinion. And it's one of those things where I remember when uh, we looked at putting the uh, the push button lights down on uh, Murray Street, corner of Magnolia and Murray, uh, we ended up having, as you know, Steve, to pay for some of that because the state government basically said, well, nobody's using that intersection, so therefore there's no need for it. And these things become self-fulfilling prophecies. You, The moment you make that area usable and safe, then it gets used. And so sometimes it's very hard to prove in advance that something is going to be used until you actually create it. Now, I know that sounds a little bit like if you build it, they will come, and maybe there is a touch of that about it. But, um, and I know that, you know, it's, you know, whenever you throw kids' safety up, it becomes very emotive. But I, I generally believe that there would be a lot of benefit uh, taking pressure off the Magnolia Road, Mengi Road intersection if Nelma Road was part of a loop that enabled the Faith side of the road and the Tananda primary side of the road to be basically operating separately from each other, which I think would, wouldn't would guarantee that would occur, but I think it would help it occur. So I just thought I'd like to share those thoughts. Thank you. Just just before you respond, Steve, if, uh, Martin, has Kathy gone? Uh, is she one to make a comment? Has she gone now? No, I'd still like to make a comment, please. Yeah, we'll, we'll jump in so you can go. Uh, members, Kathy's got to head off in a moment, so I'll let her just jump in. No, no. Sorry, man. Oh, what I was saying which is Kathy? when Kathy... Yeah, it is you, Kathy, but oh. what happened is when Kathy did ATT, it's gone to a different meeting. Oh, oh, that's okay. all right. That was gotcha. that was before, but I would like to make a comment now, if I may. So she um, doesn't have to go to another meeting. It's just that the ATT went to a different meeting. <laughs> oh, is that what happened? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That was that was the first item on the agenda, but it's okay. Got answered oh, anyway. Okay. Got. That's so all good. Um, no, I've spent um the whole last term driving my daughter to and from school um to Faith and um. I, I um, really agree with the recommendations that Steve's put forward. I disagree that Neldner Road needs to be a loop. Um, I've used Neldner Road at least once a week to keep my eye on the amount of use. And I think I've seen a maximum of 10 to 12 cars using that on a daily basis. Um, I do agree that the loop um, research road, getting cars out of Tanunda Primary School is absolutely vital that would solve uh heaps of problems the other issue is speed people aren't observing the um speed zones out the front of schools and parents just being impatient and dropping students off on the vineyard side of magnolia road so trying to get them to um abide by the proper road rules would make a huge difference but all in all it's a very enjoyable drop off and pick up situation at Faith. I, um, it's not, not as bad as what some people are saying. Uh, Russell, or Matt, just, uh, Steve, do you want, you want to comment or are you? Just, just very briefly is that um, it is very true that traffic, especially with children and pedestrian activities around traffic, is emotional. And the activities that we saw in our observations did demonstrate a sense of pedestrians acting sensibly and having fun while they were acting sensibly. So it's a, it's an, a good observation there. Thank you. Russell. Your Worship, just seeking some clarification from Steve. Are there designated properly constructed school drop-off zones at both the primary school and Faith High School, please? Uh, through you, Mayor. There are designated zones within the school property at Tanunda Primary School and also at Faith. Um, I've researched comment from parents that use them and they say it's, it's quite likely that they're choked at times. Quite often with the cars of other users like teachers and things who rationally need to park somewhere as well. 
Um, but they're not designed such that there's free and easy unfettered access by pa uh, parents that do tend to be rushing and a little bit impatient for, uh, for good reasons. A faith likewise has internal um, internal loops and there's much more room there that is monitored and enforced through the school community a lot stronger and is therefore a lot more successful. So just to comment that uh, serving on the board of a small school, uh, I'm aware that it's a, quite a challenge to make sure that you keep parents using the drop-off zones and using them sensibly. So some of what are being is being raised here is quite likely to be just about parent behaviour and needs a bit of work. I guess adding to that, there's also that um, informal drop-off through the Rex car park, Steve, as well, where there's people utilising that space. Mm. Um, through you, Mayor, can I comment on that? Yep. Yeah. The Rex car park is used a lot by parents. Um, there lies a small issue in that it is undesignated in terms of traffic delineation, and so it's a bit of a Rafferty's rules sometimes. Uh, it sort of self-regulates and, and it functions. Um, there's been a request for council to upgrade that area, uh, but notionally it has other planned uses in the future, and. Uh, that'll be something to work through in a stepwise manner as well. I didn't include that in the discussion today, uh, given that it is uh, a little bit external to the public road system. Yep, no, it's fine. Um, Carla. Uh, yeah, mine's less a question and more a comment too. Um, sort of from my experience, I've spent a bit of time sitting out there a few mornings to see what the pedestrian and vehicle activity is like and those um, observations that you've come up with, Steve, are, you know, correlate exactly with that. It, it's not a high, high volume pedestrian area. Um, I'm really happy with the suggestions for improvements here, and I think this needs to be pursued. I think a lot of it, as we've discussed, does come back to the education of pedestrians and drivers and making sure that they do follow these principles. Um, the traffic management loops in particular, particular, I think, will go a long way to helping some of the issues here. Just to touch on the Neldna Road issue, um, I think, you know, having a southern loop is a great idea, but I would be suggesting to Faith that should they wish to have a loop going back to Tanunda that way, why not use Light Pass Road um, and come back around into Basado Road? That also increases safety. They're not hitting the intersection with Basado Road. So to me, that would make more sense as a southern loop. Through you, Mayor, if I can comment. Yes. Um, yep. Again, good observations. Of note is the Dipti Way to Go program is one of the more successful ways to engage and bring together those sometimes uh, factionalised groups of parents and teachers and council and to really make a good solid cake out of it, pardon a food joke. And just on that one, I did have a question. Have either of the schools approached Dipti for that? Because, I mean, that's a really successful program that, as you said, a number of our other local schools have already engaged with. So has there been an attempt from these schools to engage? Um, I don't know. Of, no, because we haven't been engaged by Dipti to be involved in any of that participation, no. Just, just on that point, I might just add uh, the Way to Go program. When I was doing my consultancy work at Clare, I used them at the, the Clare High School, the Clare Primary School, the Aub Auburn School, and all of those areas. And and that that is 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 a great forum for that um, assessment and education and cooperation between students, parents, and everybody. And and look, they they find little things that uh, that are really just little little jewels that you don't have to throw an engineering solution at everything so yeah I, i'd be encouraging the way to go program to be adopted in this precinct by all means uh tony hearn you're on mute tony is that back again now yeah yep you're there now uh, it it didn't work from the button, but has the screen. Um, yeah, I'm surprised with a couple of the comments, um, especially Cathy's with the speed, having driven a bus quite regularly in the mornings uh, uh, in that area. The children that are coming from Murray Street, if they're going to Faith, usually go up on the southern side. Those that are going to Redeemer, 
uh, not Redeemer, the Tanunda Primary School, go up on the northern side. They cross, use the crossing in Murray Street and come up that side and then deviate, um, you know, across the back of the, the car park at the Rex. So, I, 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 you know, finding that it's, for the number of children, I'm surprised that there was as high as 20. So between 15 and 20, I would think would be a max. Um, certainly, uh, looking at the flashing lights, etc. There's one outside the Williamstown Primary, uh, in the main on the main road, and there's the flag system at Redeemer, uh, for those that didn't know. But uh, certainly, no wombat crossings. Uh, they've got them inside Redeemer, and it just about shakes the daylights out of the buses. Uh, if you had to have one of those on a regular basis uh, on that road past Faith, it would be well just just terrible so um you, see, you could have a flat one i agree with that steve i think that's that's pretty fine pretty good but um overall i think the schools are probably making a mountain out of a molehill because uh, as a bus driver we you know carrying nearly a full load of people or youngsters and the cars in the main um obey all the road rules so um that's all i've got to say on that at this stage i, I just don't think that we want to be you know really going hammer and tong at something when the children should be educated to walk up the correct side of the road. Apart from that, they would then be dropped off um, at the school by a car. Uh, David Habeck. Yeah, thank, thanks. Um, I agree with what's been said uh, all about a couple of things. I must say that I think I've been up there quite a number of times. I must say that um, there's not the number of children that I would expect for such a, a concern and also not the number of vehicles from where I've been in the past. And uh, I must say that I think there needs to be a lot of driver and student education because two weeks ago I was up there and I was just coming down from Nilna Road past the Faith College. A lady pulled up. On the other side of the road near the vines, her son actually ran in front of my vehicle across the road and hopped in the left-hand side of the car. There was no near accidents or anything like that. I was going slow and I was some distance back. But that's the sort of behaviour that is occurring because I actually saw it. Secondly, uh, I think that we've been banging on about Nilda Road for some time. If we want to look at it on this basis, that we already have a loop there. That road, Nilda Road, is probably the best unsealed road we've got. And the only other difference between that and the Bitumen Road is a little bit of dust. And I'm afraid that some people who live in the country just have to put up with it. Thank you. Kathy, Kathy Troop. Yeah, I'm um, just wondering, um, are there any um, uh, stats taken of the kids crossing over Mengi, um, walking down Magnolia, crossing over to Mengi? Through you, Mayor, I can comment there. Yes, go for it. Of, uh, in terms of the numbers that were observed, approximately 15 to 20 children were riding their bikes down Magnolia and therefore crossing Mangy Road, about 15 to 20, within that 15 to 20 minute period, uh, usually in groups of about three or four at a time. And um, I, I mean, that's when I noticed that it's actually quite, um, can be dangerous. And I've seen a person actually, or I've heard of a person who've actually had got out and um, escorted a child across the road. Um, because she couldn't go, she wasn't confident enough to go. And I understand that that's an education problem, but I'm just wondering whether is it is it applicable to put cautions caution children signs somewhere around those intersections just to, you know, I, I don't think people understand that there's schools there. Honestly, if I, I mean, I I'm not a a, a local forever, so I didn't know there was four school well you know all those children around so i just wonder whether that if it was possible to put caution signs around that area as well um is that a legal thing can we do that through you mayor there's three components there firstly it wouldn't be legal just to have caution children signs that's that sign would not mean anything in terms of recognition and that's likely to be confusing uh, second is that there's 
already a school zone uh, which was placed at that intersection many years ago, which requires traffic to travel at 25 kilometres per hour whenever there's children present. Uh, it was placed by a previous works in uh, a director, don't know who that is, but it was something that we haven't taken away uh, because it becomes an emotional attachment. Notwithstanding, if it was to be reviewed by DIPTI today, it would be removed. But thirdly, and perhaps more importantly, which does add to the safety, is that there is stop signs on Mangy Road that actually requires the traffic to stop only just a few metres after the actual crossing point. That's the safest of the components. Um, therefore, my crystal ball says at some point in the future, DIPTI will find out that we've got a children's zone in an uncompliant location and that'll, that might be removed at that point. Wouldn't worry me, the stop zones do more than the children's zone. Uh, Carla. Yeah, I just um, wanted to add one other comment because we were talking about, you know, the number of pedestrians that actually use this area as opposed to the amount of um, school community concern around it. And we've all received that correspondence that had the survey included in it. Um, and I think if you recall the correspondence, it did say that the majority of respondents to the survey had concerns, etc., cetera, um, with pedestrian activity on Magnolia Road. But when you actually look at the survey results of the 500 people that responded to that, I think about 70% of them don't actually use Magnolia Road. So I think there's a perception. Um, and again, it's a very emotive topic, but I think we have some numbers here that sort of back up the direction that we're heading in. I wasn't Just, going to mention that one, but perhaps as a, a user of that facility, and uh, I also, I'll declare a conflict, that's why I've been kept quiet. Um, I tried to do that survey, but I didn't answer the first question right, and therefore you weren't allowed to do any other questions. So I wasn't allowed to have an opinion, even though I, I uh, don't personally drive on that road. Thank you. Um, Look, by way of sort of um, wrapping it, it up, um, Steve's pointed out a couple of uh, treatments which possibly could be um, included in your footpath program. There was two areas um, down by Karen Drive as well as the connectivity alongside the wrecks because that to me when I sat out there and I've been out there with David and I've been out there with a few times and I've been out there with Steve as well, you know, the, the main thing that I noticed as far as the pedestrian and the cycling movements was the the interface and the clash with them going through the Rex car park. And I think by continuing that footpath up that side would be something that, that, that would uh, alleviate that sort of activity through the car park and the, and the um, interaction between cars and motorists and pedestrians and, and cyclists. So... Uh, I, I think that is something we could sort of look at and consider in the short term and then monitor it from there and just and and I would be encouraging the school to look at the way to go program because it proved really successful where and Steve's been doing it for a while with with our other local schools in the Brossa and I can only speak volumes of it as to how it's sort of worked in Clare and and, and that area so it it, it 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 it's a good way of having somebody independent come in uh, and look at all of this and put it under that microscope. But Steve, Steve's probably right. He, he, he might find that school sign zone that shouldn't be there too. So. But with that, any further comments? I think, you know, there's a, is there a you know, we, we're not making decisions here, but I, I think Steve's outlined some, some valid points there as far as the connectivity with the footpaths. Um, yeah, look, the reality is, unfortunately, when police go out to monitor these sites, the, the parents are the ones that they end up <laughs> stinging. So, you know, that's where it all comes back to sometimes. Okay. Uh, Tony, you got another comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, Kathy mentioned speeding. Uh, the police quite often sit up the, uh, the eastern end, aiming back towards Murray Street uh, with their radar. Um, and um, uh, I don't know what the figures are there, whether somebody, want, Martin, might be able to give the or Steve might be able to give the department a call or the police in Newry a call. Um, but if you were going to do anything, just a zebra crossing uh, might be the way to go. Yeah, just white paint on the road. So uh, that's my comment there, Mayor. Thank you. All right, anything further? Anyone want to 
If not, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you, Steve. Um, you're, you're welcome. And uh, we'll move on to the GM crops uh, consultation item. Gary. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, look, I'm not going to uh, go through the slides one by one. I'll do it by exception uh, primarily. Uh, just first of all, uh, last the 2nd of Ju uh, July, I attended a webinar that was hosted by the LGA, uh, Mans uh, Mayor uh, Sam Telfer, uh, a representative I think was from PERSA, and then there was a representative from Norman Waterhouse Lawyers. They just sort of did an outline of the process under the uh, GM Act. Uh, and my slides are pretty much a bit of a sort of a synopsis of uh, what was said that night. Uh, but I think importantly, the sort of key message that came out from the webinar was there were two key components in terms of the amendment to the legislation. One is that the actual public consultation and the second part is the actual application to, uh, to be GM free. So on that slide you've got in front of you now, so it was a more highlighted uh, elements of that of those steps. So the, obviously the public consultation, the consideration of community views is is a key component of this. Uh, and then obviously it's the actual decision to actually apply to be GM free. And then the final step by having the minister consider that application and making a decision and then formally gazetting an area GM free. Um, so like I said, that's sort of just a very quick uh, synopsis from, like I said, that webinar. Uh, one of the things that also came from that uh, uh, the messaging was that given the fact that this act is putting the onus on local government to actually take the initiative to GM free, uh, it was considered that councils should do their due diligence in terms of obviously engaging with their community to determine whether the area should be GM free or not. So that was very much the sort of uh, messaging that uh, uh, Mayor Santolfa sort of gave. Uh, and obviously in terms of the process, this is the one and only opportunity we would have as a council to actually have uh, the GM free area a moratorium remain. Uh, effectively, uh, the, the Act, once uh, fully implemented, will remove the GM moratorium uh, uh, from about November uh, this year. Uh, importantly, too, uh, obviously, the fact is that uh, the process uh, requires Council to look at uh, the GM free for the entire Council area. It cannot be a part of the Council area. The, there was initially a thought that uh, we could actually advocate for the minister to do a part of the council. Uh, I've had that clarified with the lawyers and that's not the case. Section 5 of the Act has been replaced by Section 5A, which uh, basically says that KI is GI free and any other part of the state will require a council to submit an application. So obviously, again, I think I mentioned the last time there is an opportunity for uh, two or more councils to submit a, a joint application. The other key component obviously is the application uh, and Climate Industries SA have set us a series of criteria which uh, need to be uh, considered uh, as part of the application. And importantly, it is about the financial marketing advantage and not the science or the public health impact of uh, GM crops. So in terms of then the consultation, uh, it's important that we uh, structure it so that we aren't asking people whether they're simply for or against being GM free. Uh, so in terms of the questioning, it is very much about how we look at that uh, local uh, market advantage. The other key uh, component too is obviously this is about the cultivation of GM crops and the definition of cultivation includes all sorts of plants and plant material, hence why we're also talking about processing. Again, with the public consultation, it's important that the extent that we uh, engage is broad and 
the notes there also refer to the fact that we, if there is a business that's actually operating outside the council area, we need to somehow engage with them in the process as well. So just jumping through, I'll, I won't, I'll go right to the last slide, Martin. And it's the engagement plan. So uh, Heidi, Yana, Paul and I, we, we had a bit of a conversation. And as I circulated yesterday, uh, the city of Onkaparinga uh, kindly supplied a, a copy of their survey uh, for us to review and if we wish to, to utilise. I think a survey is the, probably the most uh, beneficial way of us to uh, engage with the community at a broad level. We can use our bang the table platform, directing people to the website to uh, undertake the survey. The uh, opportunity is obviously then to target the survey based on the, on the Onkaparinga example whereby if you click on community member, you are answering a certain set of questions. If you click on as a primary producer, you're asking a, a different set of questions. So it's, it's fairly tailored to uh, what uh, we're seeking. The, the webinar sort of says there's an opportunity obviously to have a free text. So that does give people the opportunity to talk about health and environmental impacts if they choose, but obviously it can't be taken to consideration. Uh, the uh, other element in the, using the Bang the Table platform, it would allow us to do easy reporting uh, on the PERSA website. They provide an Excel uh, spreadsheet as a template to record uh, all uh, uh, comments. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the Bang the Table platform will allow, allow us to basically spit out the information in that, in that level of detail required or at least similar to it to fulfil that uh, requirement. It's a requirement for council to submit all the, uh, the, the summary of every submission received uh, as part of their application. In terms of directing people to our website and the survey, uh, the initial concept at the moment is to do a, a, a mail out of some sort, uh, particularly to those association incorporated bodies that we know of. Uh, it would be asking them to then ask their respective members uh, to go to our website. We wouldn't be, uh, be in a position to do a mail out probably to, to every association, every business or primary producer, both within the council and those that are outside uh, the council area. So we will be leaning on associations to assist us in uh, getting the message out there to complete the survey. We'll also do the traditional public uh, notice in the newspaper using our website and social media to also uh, highlight the survey. In terms of proposed dates at this stage, with a report back coming back to council to formally endorse the engagement plan, I'm proposing probably going out the, on the 27th of July uh, with the survey closing on the 24th of August. That should then allow us enough time to sort of hopefully consolidate those submissions and get a report to council in time to, if it chooses to proceed to an application, we meet the deadline of the 30th of September uh, this year. So that's it, Mayor. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, David, uh, David DeVries. On mute, Dave. You're on mute, Dave. Sorry. Um, yeah, three three points. Uh, the, the last bit's a question, but there's a couple of comments putting it in context. Uh, and I think you've kind of answered some of my questions already, Gary. The first concern I have is I, I think that obviously we need to consult, at least that's my view, and I, I think that um, – the wine industry is obviously going to have one view and that may be different to uh, other industries. And you've sort of answered the question that my concern was, what if the wine industry within Light Council, which is but is within the Barossa area, doesn't want to be part of the GM, but the rest of the Light Council area does, I guess then it's going to be difficult uh, to, for them to split that up. And I guess the question then becomes, we can't consult with... Uh, the rest of the, the the wine growers in 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 the Barossa area outside of our own patch, um, would we then do that through BGWA or RDA Barossa? 
Gary, do you want to answer the first bit and I can answer the BGWA bit? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, yeah, I think in terms of who we consult, uh, obviously we have to consult th- those who are within the Barossa Council area. But like course, as I said, yeah. there's also the opportunity to consult with those businesses that are actually operating but outside the Barossa area itself. Uh, but obviously, in terms of we get comments from uh, people from outside the council area, we, we could include it in our summary. Uh, but it will obviously would have to be uh, noted that they are actually outside the Barossa area. Of course. Yep. So the other part of that, Dave, was um, yeah, Gary's already explained you can't have a chunk of the area. It's either all in, all out. Um, mm, yeah. The... Mm. Um, conversations I've had with BGWA is they're obviously doing some canvassing of their um, um, uh, members to come back to council as part of the consultation process, uh, which will obviously include a component of light. And depending what all these outcomes are, uh, the mayor and I might have to go over there and talk with light and see what their their interests are. I guess. Let's get over the first hurdle to see if you proceed to the second hurdle. Um, of but your point is relevant. Yeah, and and it was interesting today. Uh, Martin and I had a um, link up with the uh, mayor of Adelaide Hills uh, Council as well as the CEO, and they've they've had a G, GM free policy in place, and it looks like they're going to uh, continue with that. Um, and it sounds from what Gary has said with Onka Paringa. Um, so as far as the Southern and Hills, well, our neighbouring councils over that way, they, they tend to want to stay with their uh, GM-free policies. Um, but that's the interesting thing, David, that you've raised as to what happens. And Martin, I, I thought you sort of flagged today that light was just not going to uh, do anything. It was just going to let it ride. Was that? That's their current position. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Let's not yeah. jump the gun. The whole idea no. here is to do the consultation. We, the no, consultation but, might be invariably a, the other that we just keep going. So, well, this is this is where we keep raising the issue of boundaries, and this is yet another example where they become relevant because if if we or our community decide they want to be GM free, and we're aligned with Onka Paringa and 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 the hills, and yet part of the Barossa region is in and part of the Barossa region is out. Um, that makes it very hard for the the branding of the Barossa as a green, clean sort of GM free area. If a sizable chunk of it, it allows GM to be part of its area. So um, these are relevant issues, which uh, I do believe need to be uh, addressed and need, need to be made public so people are aware of them. I, I, I'm absolutely not disagreeing with you, Dave, but at yeah. the end of the day, I can't control that one by the 31st of September. Oh, so. Of course. I mean, look, Light will do what Light does. That's that's their right. And while the Western Barossa remains in Light Council, um, that will be where the decision is made. Tony. Tony Hearn. Yep. Uh, yep. Now I'm, I'm clear. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, uh, when Gary mentioned how uh, you people were going to access Bang the Table, uh, how many growers, for instance, uh, you know, if they're getting on a bit, et cetera, or are uh, privy to this sort of activity on on computers? Um, not everybody is. We might think just because we're on it that uh, all the farmers, et cetera, are doing it. Councillor Angus, of course, is right up to speed with all of that, but um, which is good. But how many broadacre people do we actually have in our <laughs> I notice you're smiling there uh, how many uh, broadacre people do we do have if you look at light council a lot of their area would be broadacres and and that's I think canola is the only um, product that's being GM modified at this point in time I'm, I'd stand corrected on that at least in South Australia anyway so do does the GM affect vineyards that's the question and why we are up so tight about it i just like that question answered but um I, I can see dave's point that we've got both we've got light and people next door to us over the river in the barossa area that are in light but would like to be in barossa so it is a tricky situation but if somebody could answer that question i'd certainly appreciate it well, I'll start. I think it's actually very simple. I don't think anybody's upset about anything. All we're asking to do is to do a piece of consultation. That's all we're doing. 
Nobody's made a decision to do anything yet other than consult with its community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, the I answer don't... to how many broad acres is, I know Gary's getting that done, but I don't, I don't, you might have it already, Gary, I'm not sure. But yeah. I, uh, no, no, I don't at the moment. But notionally, we're talking sort of McColter, Stockwell, and Concordia uh, areas as being our main uh, crop. Mm. But does the does GM affect vineyards? Why would I, the point I don't understand is how why would the vineyards vineyards would be upset by it even if that's how the survey came out? Uh, okay, That'll okay, come through the that, BGW submission as well. Yeah, but also uh, Tony, uh, it was said that uh, obviously there is limited uh, GM crops currently in Australia, uh, but obviously that definition of cultivation means means any sort of plant so ultimately you know as GM uh, crops are further developed it could be expanded to other other forms of plant material so it's fairly broad in its application uh, and Tony so sorry, sorry just to answer the other question you had Tony uh, yes we will still rely on on the written submission uh, if people can't uh, access things online yeah. And I think that's the critical point uh, Martin's making is is it's about getting the, getting these these submissions this consultation in, and it's not about the science behind it all. I think it's all the other things that we need to take into account. Uh, Don, you had a question, oh, and then Carla yeah, just on that on that, would we be putting those things in the leader or the papers to let people know? Is that another avenue that we could do to keep, yep. make people aware? Yes, yeah, that, that, that's the intention. I've already mentioned that. Yep. Yep. Don. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just conversely, I'm listening intently to the conversations taking place, and um, I, I find it rather perverse in some respects, in as much as the Adelaide Hills Council has already got a policy GM free, and down this area, there are two vineyards, two vignerons uh, that are in the Adelaide Hills wine region, but not in the Barossa wine region, and they may well be impacted. Um, because they're in the wrong council area, and it's the opposite to the light council just over the over the river. So I just find that rather perverse in many respects. And and I think our um, um, resolution at last meeting was to ensure that we do have these discussions with our neighbouring councils, so we can get some sort of alignment the best way we possibly can. Um, on, on Carla, that, Mayor, uh, yeah, sorry. Probably, sorry, on that, yeah, Mayor, I just on. to say that I've already had a few emails from uh, colleagues from Adelaide Hills, Mount Barker, uh, uh, Alexandrina, and uh, even Victor Harbour. So there's a group of us who are now communicating and, and Playford. Uh, so there is an opportunity, obviously, if there is support to sort of share some of our, our learnings. Uh, obviously, the fact that Onkapring has already shared their survey with us. Uh, so, yes, we'll work closely with our colleagues. Carla. Um, some interesting topics raised. I just wanted to pick up on the boundaries thing again. Um, I know I've talked about this a few times, but I do think this is really key if we progress through to wanting to put an application because, I mean, m my understanding, particularly from BGWA, is if they were to ask us to consider um, remaining GM free, it would be to brand the Barossa as being GM free. And clearly they cannot do that if part of the Barossa is in a council that has chosen not to pursue that path. So I think that is something we need to consider in these discussions. We obviously can't make the decision for light. Um, and I absolutely understand where they come from. They represent a broad section of broad acre farmers. So they need to take into consider consideration their constituency. Um, but I do think it's really important we consult with the community. Um, I think that survey is a good start, but I do think that we need to evolve it a little bit. Um, particularly, we need to be asking people um, about the trade and marketing impacts. That's what we're looking for. It's not about the emotion of the subject. It's not about whether you like GM or not. Um, we need to see numbers. We need to see facts. And so far, I'm not seeing any. I guess one of the things we absolutely discussed at our first meeting and then the other four have gone on with it is our messaging has to be really strong around that economic argument. Carla, I totally agree because having a debate about the science and the philosophy, et cetera, 
it, it's a great debate, but it has no legislative meaning. So doesn't matter. We're, we're past that point now. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and on that, sorry, oh, Trick Mayor, yeah, just on. on that point, uh, one of the things, obviously, if we do utilise the Onkapringa uh, survey as a, as a good starting base, it is important that the key message up front is clear. And the things that I want to focus on is obviously why are we consulting? So outlining why the legislation has put the onus on council to undertake the consultation. The other key element is that who is ultimately responsible for making the decision? And obviously that's the minister, not council. So we can only put forward a recommendation that we either support or don't support. And obviously is, is what is the affected area? Again, that's important. Thanks, Gary. John, your comment. Yes, um, look, I agree with Carla's comments. Uh, only trouble is there is no hard and fast evidence, and we are talking about perceptions, market perceptions, and these are very hard to quantify. However, the wine industry is worth listening to because they are the biggest player by far uh, in this arena. If they urge us to remain GM free, then I think it is our duty to try and do that. If um, half the Barossa, because it's in a different council area, um, uh, embraces a GM technology, then so be it. Ultimately, it will be up to the minister to make the final call. But at least if we have done what our constituents overwhelmingly ask us to do, we can do no more than that. Um, and I think, unfortunately, uh, hard evidence is going to be in very short supply. There will be lots of opinions, uh, philosophies and um, what ifs, but ultimately we're not talking about the science, which is in fact open and shut. Uh, we're talking about perceptions and the perceptions of people potentially a million miles or a thousand miles away. So who knows where it'll go. But I don't think we should be held to ransom just because part of the Barossa is in another council area. If we feel strongly enough about it, I think we need to have the courage of our conviction and say, well, look, this is what the industry is asking for. This is the this is where we would go. Thanks. Thanks, John. Kathy Troop. Um, I'd just like to agree with Gary. I thought the uh, survey was a little um, light on how it explained that we're not looking for people's opinion. Like had this, it was just very light reference to, oh, we actually want the facts. So I would really love to see that beefed up and explained, you know, you can say something extra, but that actually is not going to say, it's not going to, the outcome is not going to be based on, those extra comments, at least then we can, you know, because you don't want to put people's um, expectations that that comment is actually going to alter our opinion, if that makes sense. So I would really um, either leave that comment out because we're really, I mean, it is good to see people's opinions, but I think it needs to be really explained well that that cannot be taken into consideration. That was all I thought. Thank you. I reckon we've done it. Mr. Mayor, I think you missed David Habeck after Carla. Oh, did I? Sorry, I did. Sorry, David. Yes, I did. Okay, okay. I'd just like to endorse what John Angus said. Uh, I think we have to run with uh, most of the area here, and we're into a wine industry area, and I'm looking for the wine industry to get back to us as to what their thoughts on are at this time because I've done a lot of reading. Most of the facts we've got are interstate uh, reasons, decisions. The only facts that we've got in relation to economic is that of Kangaroo Island, who have been selling their grain to Japan for good monies. So the rest of South Australia has been GM free. Um, so we haven't got any facts there, but we can uh, put so much on interstate uh, word and uh, they've had GM free for some time. Uh, so uh, I agree with what John has said and uh, I think we need to look after our local 
industry. Thanks, David. Yep, agree. Very good. Thank you all.